Your first announcement is you should have received a Google Form email about clubs. Uh, if you have not received this email to your student email, please contact Tempa Cabrera at the email you see on your screen. Don't forget, parent-teacher conferences are this Thursday and Friday, so you guys do not have school. Hope you enjoy your great long weekend. And finally, progress reports come out today, so make sure that you are on the lookout for that. That should be coming to your student email and on fax. That's all for now. Let's get ready for chapel. All right. Well, afternoon, guys. We want to go ahead and get started in our chapel. We want to pray right now uh, because a special day for what we have today is, again, this is the, um, our third week of every month. And on this week after chapel, we have Miss Hicks gonna share, is going to share with us some things we need to know about college preparation so we'll have some time for that. I want to give her as much time as possible. So let's pray and get started today. Father, thank you for this time that we get to take out of our day here at the end of it and focus on you. God, I pray you bless our time of chapel. May you receive all the glory in our worship, all the glory as we hear from your word. Father, may you be magnified and lifted up. May all the business of our lives, the thoughts that are kind of preoccupying us, may they just kind of pale in comparison to your beauty. And we pray this in your son's great name. Amen. Let's all stand and get ready for worship.
be seated. Thank you, Josh. Praise band. Good afternoon. We welcome you to chapel. Today, we have a very special guest with us. Um, about 41% of you are in high school for the first time um, here at Salem Baptist Christian School. So with that, some of you already know who's getting ready to speak to you, uh, Mr. Ed Stewart. He was here last year, but a number of you do not know who Mr. Ed Stewart is. And Ed, if you'll come on up, I think I'll introduce you kind of like I did with middle school. Um, I was at Liberty University in 1984-85 as a student, prayer leader, would become an RA in 85-86. For the fall, I'm going to need a roommate. And uh, my RD, resident director, was Bruce Treger. And Bruce came to me and said, Dwayne, um, I got an idea for your roommate. A uh, guy by the name of Ed Stewart. I want you to go meet him and talk with him. And uh, Bruce then said, now, Dwayne, when you go to meet Ed, you need to know something. He is different from you. Okay. How is Ed Stewart different from me? Well, Dwayne, he is from Detroit. That's the north. And it's city, and you're from Stapleton, Virginia, the South. Anybody ever heard of Detroit? Raise your hand if you heard of Detroit. Who's heard of Stapleton? Yeah, nobody's heard of Stapleton. It is a city boy. I'm a country boy. Um, how else is it different? Bruce said, he's an athlete, and you're a wannabe athlete. Okay, um, good point. It was at Liberty on scholarship for the track team. Um, and then he said, I'll just let you figure the rest of it out, how he's different from you when you meet him. And we met. And I didn't realize there was so much difference because we're both men and we both love the Lord. I got back to the dorm, Ed, and one of the baseball players came up to me and said, I heard you're considering Ed Stewart to be your roommate, to be our RA. And I said, yeah. And the guy said... I'm not joking. I'm not making any of this up. He looked right at me and he said, did you know he's black? I'm like, I just had lunch with him. He sat right across the table from me. Oh, I must have missed that. Yes, he's black. I was more concerned about him being from Detroit and a city boy than being... I'm like, what? He's black. That wasn't a, I'm like, is that supposed to be a problem? And I'm introducing Ed Stewart to you this way. He became my roommate. And the only reason we say it that way is because I was the senior RA on the floor. And we became best friends. I consider him one of the mentors of my life. He, uh, well, I'll say it this way first. We both were in each other's weddings. I was in his wedding, and then he was in my wedding. And one of the reasons is because he had an ex-girlfriend. Her name was Corbin. And Corbin comes to me and says, Dwayne, Dwayne, I, 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 I want Ed back. And I said, Corbin, that train has left the station. He's not coming back. 
Now you got to move on with life. And I had to help your ex-girlfriend get over you. And you're thankful too. And he would meet Alberta and they would get married. They got four children. Oh, they're awesome. And, and I'm dating Danita. And every now and then, I'm ready to, oh, this is, I'm done. And he would say, Cindy, Cindy Peters. And I'm like, yeah, I should be dating Cindy Peters. No, I like Danita more. And he did that to force me to keep thinking about Danita. And you helped me decide I should marry Danita. We've both been married 33 years. And it's because, again, of an incredible friendship. Now, I'm going to say something to all of you as we move. And I turn it over to him. In the 80s, if I'd have made a decision, if someone has a different color skin, they can't be my friend I'd have missed out on one of God's richest blessings to my life. And I thank God for you, Ed, and I love you, and I welcome you to Salem Baptist Christian School. Would you please make welcome my roommate, Ed Stewart. You know, yeah, you, you know your headmaster, and I always get a little nervous every time he introduces me because of stuff like that. But no, I love that man. Uh, we. 35 years, we still we call each other roommate when we talk to each other. Um, God has allowed us to have a bond that has passed through time, and I'm just grateful to know him and to be here today. One thing you need to know about me before we get started, something I believe with all my heart, the gospel changes everything. Let me say that one more time, because you need to understand this about me as we go into this time. The gospel, the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus changes everything. I've seen it in my life. My father was a member of the Black Panthers. Now, if you don't know what the Black Panthers, what that group stands for, it was a black power hate movement that grew up in the 60s and 70s. My father was not just in it, he was a leader of the Black Panthers. My dad was the kind of man you didn't mess with. He had a game face, you didn't mess with him, you didn't talk bad about him, you avoided my dad. I remember I have three sisters, two brothers, and a baby sister. One of my brothers got into a fight with somebody in our neighborhood, dad found out about it, went to the man's house, Knocked on the door, the father answered the four. Dad dropped him right there in the doorstep of his house. He turns to walk away, he had three sons. The three sons went to my dad. He dropped all three of them in the front lawn. I'm watching all this thinking, never make this man angry, ever. Dad was a bad guy. He drank, he smoked, he cussed. He was not somebody who spent time in the house. He was a bad guy. One Sunday, I got up, I was about five years old, and I'm looking for mom and dad. I couldn't find them, they weren't around. I asked my sisters, I don't know, mom and dad left this morning, I don't know where they went. We weren't a church family, we didn't go to church. We didn't do church. But I found out later that afternoon, something happened because the door opened that afternoon and a man who looked like my dad came in the house. I say he looked like him, but yet he didn't because the game face was gone. The anger that he carried around was gone. That same man went through the house, he collected all of his alcohol, all of his beer, all his liquor, he boxed it up, threw it out. His pipe collection, his Cigar collection, he gathered it up, he threw it out. He never cursed again. He started reading stories to me and my little sister, and we're thinking, What's, who's this guy? We really knew something happened the following Sunday, because all eight of us, which was a sight to behold in and of itself, got into a car, drove 30 minutes outside of Detroit to an early all white mega church and we pull in the parking lot we're all getting out going 
Something didn't add up. And my brother actually said out loud, Dad, didn't you tell us about why people shut up, boy, get in church? You know what we found out? Dad had gotten saved in that church. He had come to faith in Christ in that church, and that was the change we witnessed. He became a member in that church, a leader in that church, an elder in that church, a Sunday school teacher in that church, and all six of us, brothers and sisters, came to faith in that church because we witnessed 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, anyone in Christ becomes a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. I saw it with my own eyes, and it has forever changed my life. If my father, who is 87 now, were to walk in here right now, you would call me a liar. There's no way this guy was all that way. He is an incredible man who has taught me so much about life, still speaking and speaking the truth of God all over the country for the Gideons. An amazing man changed by the life of God. Well, that's a little bit of my story. Now I want to tell you about another story. And if you have a Bible or if you have a Bible app, turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. It's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 15. Because I want to talk today about something that I think will be helpful, instructive, and a blessing to you. Because there's one thing I want you to hear. If you don't hear anything else I hear today, hear this. God loves you. I want to repeat that. God loves you. And it's a love that is very present and very real. And Jesus, and he's trying to express and show God's love, Jesus often used stories called parables to tell us about God's love for us. And he does it in this parable, in this story, Luke chapter 15, verse 11, we will see the love of God for you. It starts off like this, Luke 15, 11. And he, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. So what we see here is a man who loves his son. We know this man loves his son because he's done something incredible. He has created in his son a beautiful home, a beautiful heritage, a safe place for his son to be and to live, and my marker is dead. So I will change colors. That's what you do on the fly. There we go. This man loves his son, and we know he loved his son because he cared for his son, not only as he lived with him in the day, but after if something bad would happen to this man, he set aside an inheritance for his son. I was thinking about that last night, and I thought, hmm, how can I express to these kids what this inheritance looked like? Well, I looked up a couple stats. The average income of an adult in Winston-Salem is about $45,000. That's average, that's higher and lower, but as a base set, about $45,000. If you want to retire and make sure you have $45,000 for the rest of your life, you need to have about $3 million invested right now. So what this man has done, he's invested for his son's future. He's loved and raised this son, but this son, even though he has a great father who loves him and has cared for him, he has said, you know, Dad, I don't want to wait till you die. I'm tired of living under your house. I'm tired of living under your rules. I want my inheritance now. Give me my money now. That is what has happened. And this loving father doesn't argue with the son. He doesn't fight with the son. He collects and sells whatever he has to sell, and he hands over to this son this inheritance. Now, let me just ask you something. If you had $3 million on you right now, what would you do? You're, you're going to spend it, aren't you? Well, look at verse 13. 
Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a long journey into a far country. And there he squandered his living and his money, his prosperity in reckless living. That boy got $3 million and I could see him with this big satchel and he goes off to the big city. And let me tell you, it's a party every night and it's all on him. He's just reaching in that bag and just throwing money everywhere. He's got a posse, he's got groupies, he's got it all and it's all on him. And man, he's just throwing the money around. I'm free of my old man, I'm free of his rules, I'm doing life on my own and man, this is great, I am on my own doing my own thing. But you see, that young man learned something, a hard truth. Our feelings lie to us. Our feelings aren't always honest and true to us because although he was having a good time, it was going to come to an end. Look at verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. You see, one day he's throwing the money around and they're getting together, he and his buds, and they're going to have a party. He reached in that bag and He's turning it inside out and he's shaking it. The money is gone. And you know what else went with the money? All the, all the posse, all the quote unquote friends, all the groupies, and he is all by himself. And to make matters worse, a famine hits the land. So not only is he alone and not only is he without food, a famine hits. And it gets so bad, look at verse 15. He went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. He was so desperate for food. He was longing to feed, eat the trash the pigs ate. Now how low does it have to get? for you to get there. Well, that's what happened to him, because you know what happens when you do your own thing and you live a life on your own and you live a life in sin? You get broken. It seems fun for a while, but then the money runs out and the friends run away and then you're hungry and you're all by yourself. And that's where this young man is. From the highest of the highs to the lowest of lows. He's gone to a far country, afraid, apart from his father, free. And now he's starving and alone. But there's hope. Look at verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants had more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. See, in his brokenness, in his hunger, in his emptiness, he realized it was good back with dad. It was good back home. Even the servants had it better than I had. He came to his senses. He saw life as it truly is. Sin lies to you. It's not true. Your feelings lie to you, and it leaves you broken. But prayerfully for this young man, he woke up and he came to his senses. And the Bible continues to say this great thing about what he did. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. You see, that boy didn't stay in the pig pen. He chose to come back home. He repented. He went from where he was and he went and found the Father. He turned from his mistake and he went back home. What kind of reception do you think the Father had? If that was your son who disrespected you like that, who took that money and blew it, how would you respond to that young man? Well, look at the Father's response. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. You see, when this boy turned from his wrong to his father, he found the father's love right there waiting. 
And he confessed to the Father. He said how wrong he was. But the Father's response in verse 22 is precious. The Father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The boy came home. The father embraced him, and he's right back in the good hand and graces of the father. That parable is a picture of how God loves everybody in this room. Because you see, God has a design for your life. God has a perfect design for everybody in this room. A, a plan for you to be his child, to be in his family, to be loved by him, to be worship, worship him, to be close to him, to have his peace, his joy, his love, his spirit in you. That's God's design. That's what he wants for all of you. But see, there's a problem in all of our lives, of something that keeps us from God in this thing called sin. Sin pulls us away from God's design to do life on our own. We cheat, we lie, we steal, we get into pornography, we get into all these other things that are wrong. We're disrespectful. We are disrespectful to parents, to teachers. We treat others bad, we bully others. We do all these things that are against God's design because we want to do life on our own. Romans 3.23 puts it this way. The way, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. All of us have gone from God's design to do life on our own. And you know what they don't tell you about sin? What they don't tell you about bad things? They're fun for a moment. They feel good. If sin didn't feel good, we wouldn't sin. It's like the person who takes drugs for the first time. They get a high that they spend the rest of their lives trying to get again, and they never attain it. Sin lies to us, and it gets us trapped, and once you get into sin, it leaves you broken. Broken relationships, broken in spirit, broken in our souls, addicted, wasted, abused, that is the result of sin. Romans 6.23 puts it this way, for the wages of sin is death. When you sin, you get something. You get a wage. You earn something. And what you earn when you sin is death. You earn brokenness. Spiritual brokenness. Physical brokenness. That's what happens when we sin. But you know there's still really good news. Because Romans 6.23, the whole verse is this way. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when we repent of our sins, when we ask God's forgiveness of sin, and we believe in his work for us on the cross, and we ask him to come into our lives, we get his glorious salvation. Romans 5, 8 says it this way, God demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were in our sins, Christ died for us. And because he died for us, he offers to us this great gift of salvation. And when you ask God to come into your life, you are now able to pursue him. I can't spell. That's okay. You get the message. When you ask God into your life, you are now on the path to pursue God's design. And for some of you, you've never heard that before. This whole thing is new to you. This whole thing about God's love, about sin, and about salvation, you've never heard that. Well, I hope today, this day, some of you make the decision to turn to Christ for salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life in his glorious design. But there's another group who needs to hear this message of the prodigal. Because remember, the prodigal was a part of a family. 
And you know, family members, children of God, can still sin. Children of God can still not be all that they need to be for Christ. Children of God can still not follow Him like they should. And yes, believers can still sin. And there may be some of you in this room, you're a Christian, there's no doubt about that. You're going to heaven when you die, no doubt about that. But you're not living for Him like you should. You're not reading your Bible, you're not praying, you're not helping one another, you're not, you're bullying, you're doing, you're treating your parents wrong, other, you are finding yourself right here, even as a believer. And you find yourself with broken relationships, like the relationship with God is broken. But maybe you're tired of that. Maybe you now see that there's more to this life than being broken and apart from God. You as a believer can also repent. 1 John 1, 9 says it this way, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And even believers can turn to him and could put back on the path of following Christ. I'm remembering, I'm reminded of a story of a great Indian chief. This is back, back when, you know, before the America was settled and the Indians ruled and reigned across the earth. There was this wise old Indian chief with a full headdress, one star lit evening by the fire, talking to his son, encouraging him, helping him grow up to be the next chief. And he's imparting wisdom to his son. And that chief looks across the fire to his son and says, son, there's something you need to understand. In the heart of every man is a war. There's a war raging in the heart of every man on earth. It is a war between a bad wolf and a good wolf. The bad wolf of dishonesty, deceit, lies, and the good wolf of love and kindness. These two wolves are at war in the heart of every man, and the war goes on eternally. There's a pause. The son looked at the father and said, Father, how do I know which wolf will win? And leaning forward, the chief says, the one you feed. Do you read your Bible? Do you pray and talk to God? Do you put this word that is here and is taught in this school to practice in your life? Well, if you're not doing that, guess what? You're starving the good wolf, the spirit of God that is in you. And when you starve that side of you, you're feeding the bad side. Now, there's nothing wrong with being on social media. There's nothing wrong with all those things. But if you are not feeding the word of God into your life, you are setting yourself up for failure. So today my question is this. The prodigal is in all of us. Whether you are a Christian or not a Christian, the question is today, are you prepared to do something about it? If you've never known Jesus Christ as your savior, are you willing to turn from your brokenness to him? Some of you, you're a believer, but you're not living for him like you should. Maybe today you need to rededicate yourself to pursuing God's design in your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Everyone please, in this moment, close your eyes and in prayer consider these things. First of all, I want to ask this question. Is there anyone in this room who can relate to being a Christian but not living like you should? You've not been content to live the way God wants you to live. You've wanted to do life on your own even as a believer. You've not been the believer, the Christian you should be. But today you're feeling inspired and convicted of God that it's time for you to, you've come to your senses. And today you want to rededicate, to refocus your life, to live along God's design for you. Is there any of you who are Christians who aren't living for him, 
that today you want to pray and ask that starting today you will live for him. If that's true of any of you, would you raise your hand? You haven't been living for the Lord. You haven't been doing what you should do. You haven't been living as you're supposed to. But today you say, I will, I choose to follow him. Is there anyone like that today? Would you raise your hand? Thank you. Is there anyone else? Maybe all this is new to you. You don't know anything about this whole thing about salvation. All this is new. But you've come to the sense that you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never had one before, but you would like to know more about this Jesus. Is there anyone for the first time would like to talk to someone about a relationship with Jesus Christ? If that's true, raise your hand. Anyone like that? Here's my request. If you would like to rededicate yourself, to refocus yourself into being what God wants you to be, to pursue his design for your life, if that's what you want, I want to ask you to do something really bold. I want you to stand up and come here and let me pray over you. You haven't been living for the Lord, but you want before the Lord to say to him, I'm serious about this. I haven't been living for you, but today, starting today, I want to pursue your design. If that's your heart, if that's your desire, I want to ask any of you who have that feeling to come, come forward and allow me to pray with you this morning. I haven't been living for God, but I want to. And I want to dedicate my life, rededicate my focus to be with God. Is there anyone like that this morning, this afternoon? If so, come. Allow me to pray. We'll wait just a moment. Well, Father, we say this. I thank you so much that the prodigal is in all of us. We all have strayed. We've all gone away from you. But I'm so grateful that we serve a God who loves us so much, who cares for us so much, that in him, we always have a great welcome home from him. A God who, when we turn from our sins to him, takes us in and celebrates and worships and is glad that we are coming back to him. And he brings us in and loves on us as a loving father that you are. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your work in our lives. Thank you for the students of Salem Baptist Christian School. And I pray that this is a dynamic year for them and that they will spend their days pursuing your grand and glorious design for them. We thank you for them and bless them the rest of this day, we ask. In the great name of Jesus, amen. Thank you all for your time and patience. Well, thank you, roommate. You told them the truth. God loves them. Folks, God loves you. And the greatest thing about his love is that he allows you to repent, to make a U-turn. Though you cannot go back and make a brand new start, you can start today and make a brand new end with Jesus Christ. And that's the beauty of the gospel message. So roommate, again, thank you. Um, you were down in um, Columbia, South Carolina, Shandon Baptist Church. Stop by and see um, Brother Ed. Um, I believe I'm looking for Hillary Hicks as part of our extension of chapel so we can accomplish things with you that we don't usually get to. Today, we're going to talk about high school, college, and career prep 101, so that you guys can start getting ready for uh, what God may have for you. Not everyone will go to college, but a whole lot of you will be going to college. And um, uh, Hillary, do you need the microphone or are you? All right, I'm going to put that in your hand. Welcome, Miss Hillary Hicks. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. 
how are we? Good? A little tired? It stopped raining, and I'm really glad for that because I enjoy the sunshine. Anybody else? There's some rain people in here, too. I know some people like it when it's real dreary. Some people like it when it's bright, and I'm one of those who needs it to be really bright. Um, so again, my name is Mrs. Hicks, and some of you I haven't been able to meet yet, but I'm the school guidance counselor and the academic advisor, and I am really, really excited and thankful to Pastor Rick for planning this time in once a month. We're going to be able to take a look at some topics that are applicable to you in high school and for college and career prep. This is a great time for us to sit together because there's a lot of you, and there's one of me, and I'm only here part-time. 20 hours a week is not enough time for me to get with each one of you individually. So I'm thankful for this time. Hopefully it will spur some conversation for us so that when you do need to seek me out one-on-one -on -one, or I need to seek you out one-on-one, -on -one, we've got a foundational basis. And you may already know, hey, you spoke about this in chapel. That's what we need to talk about today. So one thing I want to let you know off the bat is that anything that we're going to talk about is also going to be on our website. So you're going to have this PowerPoint with my notes typed on each slide. So mom and dad, you can find it. You can go back and look at it if you have questions. I'm also going to create a QR code that's going to go on a bulletin board on the hallway so you can scan it and get straight to this material. Okay, I want you to be able to see it and have it and refer back to it. So first I want to explain just a little bit about what I do and what I can help you with. So my role is to help you understand academic progression. So 9th to 10th to 11th to 12th to college. And to assist you with tools that you can use to explore what you want to do after you graduate and then how you're going to get there because that process is gonna look very different for each one of you. So today we're gonna start with a topic that is completely foundational. It's your GPA. I'm gonna figure out which button to push. Ha! Are you gonna push the buttons, Ms. Urker, or am I? You're gonna do it? Excellent, thank you. We're gonna start with a topic that's foundational. We're gonna talk about your GPA, and we're gonna look at what it is, how it's used, why it's important, how does it actually go up or down, how it changes throughout high school, what you're gonna need to know about it when you apply for college. I get the most questions about GPA. All the time, students will say, what is my GPA? What does GPA mean? How do I raise my GPA? So this is where we're gonna start because you need to understand the math behind it. Even if you're not a math person, you need to understand how it becomes this number that you have. How do we go from letter grades on a report card to a number, okay? So GPA stands for your grade point average, and it is calculated from your final grades. At the end of a school year, all of those final grades this is how we're going to get to a GPA. It means for every final letter grade that you receive, there is a specific numeric value that is attached to it. Each one, to an A plus, to an A, to an A minus, to a B plus, to a B, to a B minus, all the way down to a D minus. F is a zero, nothing for an F, but all the way down to a D minus. So when you look at a report card, you see a letter grade, right? You're only gonna see letter grades. You're not gonna see these numeric values, but I need you to understand them so that you can figure out and know what you're looking at and know how you can determine, hmm, I really want it to be raised. How am I gonna get it there? Okay, so what determines the number is the scale. So at Salem, we've got four different types of scales. You know them by your class types. So we have the regulars classes, like English 1, Algebra 1, or Chemistry. Then we have the honors classes, like Geometry Honors, English 2 Honors, Government and Economic Honors. We've had students who've had AP classes previous to this year. We have students in dual enrollment classes, which are the college classes you can take through community college. And then we've got a class that is pass-fail. 
So the, the numeric value that's attached to the letter grade is going to depend on these scales. What scale is it? So for example, when you look at a regulars class, like English 1, a regulars class is at a 4.0 for an A. If you get an A in your English 1, it looks like a 4. If you get an A in your English 1 honors, it's got an extra point attached to it. It looks like a 5. If you get an A in previously an AP class or now a dual enrollment class, it's got two extra points to it. It looks like a six. Do you see the difference? We've got an A all the way across, but basically the level, the harder the class, the higher the value of the numeric, the number that's with the letter. That's what I want you to remember. The higher the number goes is typically the harder the class. So let's look at an example, if you'll go to the next slide. Okay, so this is based off of a regular class, like English 1. If you have an A+, plus, that's got a 4.3 number with it. An A is a 4. An A- minus is a 3.7. It's going to drop by 0 .03 every single time. So every single time you get a C on the end of your report card, that's going to add two points to your GPA. If you're down in that D minus range, it's a 0 0.7, which isn't going to do very much at all. This is for a regulars class. Remember, that honors class is at a 5. It's an extra point. So an A in an honors class is a 5.0. So a B would be a 4.0. Does that make sense? Everybody following and tracking me? I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding. That's good. OK. So let's look at an example of what a report card would look like. So if my GPA is calculated by adding up the numeric value associated with the letter grade, then it's divided by the number of classes I take. That's why it's called the grade point average. So it takes these numbers, it adds them all up, and then it divides it by how many classes. Pretend this is my freshman year, and I made an A plus in PE and health. I made a B in my writing class, we see a B plus in my English one, an A in my New Testament, a B plus in physical science, a C in algebra one, and an A in US history. Not too shabby. So these numbers on the right, that's my numeric value. So my A plus earned me 4.3. My B earned me a 3.0. My B plus earned me a 3.3. My A in New Testament gave me a four. My physical science gave me a 3.3. My algebra one gave me a 2.0 and my U.S. history gave me a 4. All of that added together is a 23.9, but because it's an average, I need to divide it by my seven classes, which is that 3.4 GPA number. And now I have a high school GPA. All of those numbers added together divided by my number of classes. So if you'll go to the next slide, this is my sophomore year, okay? I didn't do so hot. So I did okay in my Old Testament, but things kind of went downhill. I got a C in my Spanish 1 and a D in my English 2, B minus in my computer elective, a C minus in biology, a D minus in geometry, math is not my thing, and a D in government. So you see, look, there's that 4.3 again for my A plus. But now you're going to see a 2 for the C and a 1 for the D. So you start adding those up and dividing them by 7, and you see that 1.9 GPA. But here's where GPAs get tricky, because they build off of one another. So my freshman year was OK. My sophomore year got real low. It's not year one plus year two divided by two. It's still divided by class, by credits earned. All of those numbers are all of my 14 classes. Added together is 37.3. Divided by 14 is a 2.66. So I just went from a 3.4 to a 1.9 to a 2.66 cumulative GPA. That's a big drop, isn't it? So what I need you to see is how quickly it can go down. Because a GPA will drop a lot faster than it will come back up. It is much, much harder to get it to come up. If you come in and you blow off your freshman year, and you say, I'm going to worry about this when it's time for me to apply for college, then you have made a gigantic mistake. 
because you cannot recover well from an extremely low GPA. We're going to take a look at a quick video that's going to help us understand how hard and how much work it is to bring a GPA way back up. Hey everybody, Scott here. In this short video, I'd like to do something called the GPA game. And in this game, we're going to assume that a student has taken six classes. They have two Bs and four Cs. Their GPA is a 2.33, and they would like to get on the Dean's List, and that requires a 3.5 GPA. They'd also like to get into a program next year, and it requires a high GPA, so they need to raise their GPA up a little bit. Let's assume, for instance, that all classes are three credit classes. It just makes it easier. And before I go any further, I'd also like to note that I'm not saying the grades are the most important thing in the world. Of course they're not, but sometimes you need a good GPA to do the things you want to do in school. So my question to you is, how many A's will a student need to get to get their GPA from a 2.33 up to a 3.5? Just think about that for one second. And then I'll go through and I'll start adding classes all straight A's and see how many it takes. You got that in your head? Okay, well let's start adding classes here and see what we have. And by the way, you can do this as well. Just go to Google, type in GPA calculator, find the calculator, and then just put in the grade and the number of credits. You'll need to do both. And you can see how the GPA just went up there a little bit. Let's add another class. They're doing pretty good. Okay, it's probably not going to take too many, right? It's two classes. I need to keep track of this. Let's add another class. Straight A's, we're assuming straight A's. Looking pretty good. Here's four classes. All right, now their GPA is a 3.0. Okay, so how many is going to take to get up to a 3.5? Let's check it out. I'm going to speed up the video just a little bit so you can see how this works. Okay, well, if you're following along, you can see that this student has had to get straight A's, 12 straight A's, to get their GP up to a 3.44. Let's see how many more classes it takes to get up to their desired 3.5. Not yet. Okay, here we are. This student would have had to earn 14 A's all three credit classes to get that GP up to a 3.5. My point here is obviously that once your GPA is lower than you desire, it's really difficult to move it a lot higher. You can start moving it a little bit higher, but because there's so many classes, the numbers just don't go up that quickly. So please think about the GPA that you'll want to have for your programs, for your life, for your self-esteem, whatever it might be, because sometimes if you dig yourself a hole, it can be really difficult to dig your way out of that hole. Best of luck, everybody. Okay, that was a lot of A's. That was 14. You have at most if you're not taking dual enrollment classes, seven in one year. This is what I need you to understand. If you start way down here with your GPA, it only inches up. And if by the time you get to your junior year, you want yours to be higher for a specific college application or maybe a scholarship, you might not have enough time or enough credits that can get you that high. So that's why particularly for freshmen, we got to really think about this and we've got to evaluate where you're at. Sophomores, this is a really good year to keep going strong or to recover as much as possible. So 14 A's, straight A's, 14 straight A's is what it took to get that GPA up. Okay, so any time that we're going to talk about a topic, we're going to ask this question. How does the truth 
I know about scripture apply to how I approach this? So how does the truth that I know about scripture apply to how I approach my GPA? Because it does. We're going to answer this in two parts. My first thought is that 1 Corinthians 10.31 tells us what. We're familiar with this passage. It says, whether we eat or whether we drink, whatever we do, we do all for the glory of God. That includes how I'm getting to my GPA. The number itself, the Lord doesn't care. But he really cares about how we get there. I'm talking about stuff like integrity, being truthful, and not cheating through to get a higher GPA. Discipline, working hard even when I don't want to academically. Character is saying, I'm going to own that low grade or I'm going to own that mistake and I'm going to improve upon it. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move forward with it. It's the how we get to that number that really matters. When we look at a passage like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For by grace I have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that I cannot boast. This tells me something really important, foundationally important. It tells me that there is nothing performance-wise that I can do to make God love me any more or any less. There is nothing that I can do on a performance level to have right standing before him, to achieve salvation through him. This may be a little bit tough for some of us because some of you put a lot of pressure on yourself with your GPA. And some of you, you're smiling at me, I know. <laughs> some of you have moms and dads that put a lot of pressure on you for your GPA. And I have heard some moms and dads who have communicated through their words and through their tone that they love you more when you perform better academically. You know it, and I know it. I have heard some of you who look at your grades and say, I am not worth anything because this grade was not as high as I wanted. But when we look at our GPA through the truth of Scripture, we understand that our educational culture needs this as a benchmark. We're not going to get into college if we have no GPA. But foundationally, it does not earn me right standing before the Lord. Yes, he cares about how I get there. Character and integrity and discipline. Cares about my work ethic. But there are far greater things that are important. So while we will learn about this, because we are in an educational culture, we will also remind one another, and I will remind you, that this is not who you are. It gives us a picture of how you are doing academically, but it is not who you are. So I'm going to leave you with each grade having an action point. So my freshmen, hi guys, way back there, I need for you to remember that this is so foundational for you. If you need help academically, then we need you to ask. If you are struggling academically, we need you to ask for help. For my sophomores, I want you to think about this as a year to recover. Because if you do not start now, it's like that video, we will not be able to raise it high enough. My juniors, if you know, I really want my GPA to have a good boost. How do I do that as effectively as possible? 
There are ways to work on that through extra credits like dual enrollment. And if you're not already involved in that and you, you want to talk about it, about qualifying or seeing if you qualify and pursuing that opportunity, you let me know. And my seniors, you're going to be asked for this. This is the absolute benchmark for a college application. Colleges will not even crack your application open or click into your application if you do not meet their, their GPA benchmark. You could have all the extracurricular in the world, but if your GPA is not where they want it, they're just gonna slide it right to the side. So when you need this, come and ask me. You can also ask Mrs. Watkins in the front office. She can look it up for you. They're also gonna ask you something. They're gonna say, I want your weighted GPA and your unweighted GPA, seniors. All you need to know about that is that your weighted is just like we walk through, but your unweighted takes out all those extra honors and AP points and just looks at it foundationally based on a regular scale. Kind of helps them put everybody into perspective. So no, no they're gonna ask you for both and I can help you find both, okay? So, so each of these action points, why do I tell you those things? Because yes, it is important for college and career and beyond, but I need you to understand something else too. It's important for high school here at Salem because according to our handbook, you have to have a 1.7 GPA at the end of your freshman year to promote to the sophomore year. And at the end of your sophomore year, you've got to have a 1.8. And at the end of your junior year, you need a 1.9 and you have to have a 2.0 to graduate. Now, those are really not high GPAs, quite honestly. But if you come in and blow off freshman year and blow off sophomore year, you need to know in the back of your mind that you may not be able to recover high enough to finish your years at Salem Baptist Christian School, let alone set yourself up for academic success. So 101 about the GPA. If you have other questions as you go through it, especially seniors, when you need them, when you need to know that number, Come and find me, shoot me an email, and ask, okay? So we'll look forward to next month taking something else and breaking it down really carefully. Um, again, if you've got questions, the best way that you can reach me is by email, and that's on the website. Um, or you can ask Mrs. Watkins in the front office, and she can direct you to me as well. So thank you guys for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hicks. Luke 2.52, Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God, favor with man, and growing in wisdom intellectually is part of why you are here. All right, Rick, we're wrapping up today at 2.46. So um, those who drove, you can leave now and get your vehicle and be gone. You that didn't drive and will need to be picked up, say that again.